Well, joining us here in the studio this morning is the historian broadcaster, Tessa Dunlop. Uh, and Tessa, you, it's interesting listening to Robert and, and, you know, it's fascinating hearing the stories of those places. But there are areas of the First World War that get more attention than others and that's something you've been drawn to yeah I feel other, that other very stories. strongly I think first of all we we tend to every nation historically navel gazes so we're always gonna you know shine our lamp most closely on the home front and the western front and I think we've become better at including our imperial non-white narrative from World War One recently but we still wholly neglect the eastern front where actually in terms of fatalities and numbers who died I mean it's her, it's horrific. And when I, I did a straw poll around friends and people on the train yesterday, nobody could tell me more than one, the name of one of our allies on the Eastern Front, where countries like Serbia lost nearly a quarter of their population, Romania nearly an eighth of their population, you know, as well as, of course, Russia, which just kind of sucked up the horror for three years and then, and then revolted. But um, the reason I came across this was through discovering an English-born princess who became Queen of Romania, Queen Marie of Romania. And in 1918, the New York Times wrote, she is the vivid and unforgettable personality of the war. You best explain something about... So and here she is. Yes. This is actually moving footage of her. So explain who, who she was and um, what the role she, was. She was Queen Victoria's granddaughter. She was born in Kent. There's a statue about to go up to her, in fact, in Kent. Um, and she married off, age 17, to this very plain king in Romania, or prince at the time. And then uh, Romania, in the end, in 1916, finally decide, after we browbeat them and bully them, we know that they're not going to cope, and sure enough, they collapse. Um, they join us in 1916, Germany in three months is in Bucharest, and Queen Marie just adopts the, the sort of... She becomes the symbol of her nation, and one of the ways she does this is she never gets out of her nurse's whites. Now, on the Eastern Front, in the Orthodox countries, they really go for it, collars, cuffs, down to the ground, sort of almost Madonna-like, with the red cloth, with that universal symbol of hope that remains as such today, blazing on her forehead. And one of the reasons why this was so significant and powerful was that Edith Cavell, the British nurse, had been murdered. It was such an own goal and a tragedy. She'd been murdered by the Germans in 1915. She was a nurse who helped both sides. She was actually at the um, court, I think, uh, taking, trying to get um, injured Allied troops into neutral Holland. The Germans caught her and they murdered her. And we made a massive PR thing of this. We were desperate, remember, at the time to get America to come in on our side. Well, it's so interesting we to... to hear how we actually did that, because yeah. <clears throat> in this day and age, you can understand PR, so to speak, press mm. relations, you can understand how it works, and we've got social mm. media and TV footage all around. How did we manage to take the story? Because this Edith K Caval was actually a middle-aged woman yes. who was not portrayed that way when we decided to appeal to the Americans to, to help us out. No, you're quite right. Um, really interestingly, I mean, she was 49 and a career woman, a sort of classic hardy spinster, you know, out she went to help. And um, she was sort of um, remodelled as this helpless victim. You know, this woman who had been killed by... Well, not entirely helpless, because obviously she was a nurse, and, but a woman who had been killed a martyr. And we did that because it was, the, it was the era of the emerging mass media. Arguably, more people read newspapers then than they do now. They certainly read more about foreign relations, if the papers are anything to go by. You have newsreel, as you see. You have photography. Um, and so it was very effective. And the result was... And anyway, um, it was true even before Edith Cavell's death that the acceptable imagery of a woman during the war was to be a nurse. It was feminine. It was a role that was seen as acceptable for women in a very controversial time for women, of course, with suffragette and the vote being given in 1918. And if, if for a man it was the soldier's uni uniform, for a woman it was the nurse. And we really needed a bit of glamour and celebrity. And it has just on a slightly wider thought, if mm. I may. Uh, Robert was talking to us earlier on about 100 years, and maybe this is a time when the way that the, the um, First World War is marked might change. But then you hear those individual stories that you accounted mm. for, the, those stories, and you think they are timeless. People are always going to want to hear those stories. Do you think you 100 years will, will change the way we... You know, 101 years, will we, will we do the same again? I, mean, I think you have to remember that history is always politicised. That's why, you know, they're always tinkering with the history syllabus in schools. And actually, it would do us all a massive favour, I think, if we could get a bit of space from our own two 20th century wartime narratives and look at the broader picture. And in particular, that World War I, I think we do struggle a bit sometimes with our relations with Eastern Europe, and I think it might help if we understood these countries, you know, fought alongside us. They were our... 
they were our kindred spirits. And actually, when countries like Romania joined us and Greece in 1917, we hailed this as a massive triumph. Look, if Romania have joined us, we must be going to win. Actually, didn't turn out to be the case at all. Because remember, all the way through, it was gridlock. And we desperately needed to show people we're going to win. And so if you get a new country in on your side, and then you get a queen who's English, have I not English blood in my veins, said Queen Marie? You know, that's great. It distracts people from the horror on the ground. It's very interesting hearing your thoughts. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm talking more about it, if anyone's interested. Tessa, thank you. 